Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air with significant breaking news. The Pentagon just announcing that the last U.S. troops have withdrawn from Afghanistan, marking the end of America's longest war. Nearly The last C-17 lifted off from Hamad Karzai International Airport this afternoon at 3.29 p.m. East Coast. This is what you are, are hearing now, the eruption of celebrity gunfire by Taliban supporters in the city. When the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, some analysts saw it as a kind of bookend, the sun setting on U.S. global power. The cost was 2,461 U.S. service members and civilians killed. 1,144 NATO allies killed. More than 48,000 Afghans killed. A war once called Operation Enduring Freedom, proving to be neither enduring nor leaving a legacy of freedom. Maybe it's no surprise that China's state-controlled media outlets, they also dug that narrative. One opinion piece in the Global Times read, the U.S. calls the move a drawdown. It is, in the truest sense, a meltdown. Another editorial framed the retreat as a warning for Taiwan, which enjoys U.S. support but worries about China's growing ambition and military harassment. At the top of the page... There's a cartoon, an American eagle walking the president of Taiwan down the street right toward an open manhole. The message was pretty clear. America, it's not a reliable partner. On this episode, with the dust still settling around the U.S. exit from Kabul, we turn our attention to the narrow strait that divides China and Taiwan. Because some analysts believe that this is the most likely flashpoint for the next U.S. war. If Biden reconfigures foreign policy to focus more on threats at home, will that leave us unprepared to defend U.S. interests abroad? Or should the U.S. change its thinking on these faraway fights? What is actually going on with the economy nowadays? The price of gas? Inflation? Are we in a recession? I'm Jeff Guo, co-host of NPR's Planet Money. Come along with our super team of econ experts as we delve into the stories that show you how the world really works. That's Planet Money from NPR. When Biden defended the drawdown of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, he listed some other areas where we need to focus on fighting climate change, for example, and COVID-19. We have to defeat COVID-19 at home and around the world. Make sure we're better prepared for the next pandemic or biological threat. And on, quote, shoring up America's core strengths to meet the strategic competition with China. With China and other nations, that is really going to determine our future. But what if that competition boils over into aggression? Some experts think that there are scenarios where China could try to take the island of Taiwan by force, potentially drawing the U.S. into the fray. And it doesn't help that Lately, China's been stepping up assault drills near Taiwan and flying warplanes near its shores. It's also been bulking up militarily, expanding its missile program and growing its navy. China has been modernizing its nuclear arsenal, too, although its stockpile is still a fraction of that of the United States or Russia. And unlike the U.S. and Russia, China maintains a no-first-use policy. One would think, regardless, that the threat of nuclear war it might help keep the peace. But some folks have argued that both China and the U.S. believe that a dispute over Taiwan could be fought as a limited war. So nuclear weapons, they don't really enter the calculation, even if maybe they should. Do you agree with folks who would say this is perhaps the most dangerous flashpoint for a possible U.S. war in the near future? Yes, Yes, and definitely in Asia. Other areas like the South China Sea, East China Sea, those continue to be points of tension, and China continues to push the envelope. But at least in the short term, I think Taiwan is the more likely bet. Oriana Schuyler Mastro studies China's military as closely as anyone. She's a fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. She wrote an article recently that got a lot of attention and some pushback in favor of some of these arguments. Chiefly, 
She's concerned that China could invade Taiwan in the next six to eight years. One reason, she argues, is that Beijing is kind of obsessed with Taiwan, which it claims as Chinese territory. So Xi Jinping has said, and I think this is how they feel, that this experiment, right, of China's rise, of their rejuvenation, cannot be complete until they have Taiwan again. To understand why China cares so much about an island that's three times smaller than Ohio, you have to go back a bit to something called the Century of Humiliation. Here's like 250 years of history very quickly. China was, you know, chilling in China, doing just fine. Europeans come over and they're like, we want to trade with you. And the Chinese are like, you have nothing to offer us. True. So the Europeans who want to break into the Chinese market decide to get the Chinese people hooked on opium because it's the only thing they have to offer is drugs. The Chinese government bans opium because they don't want their people hooked on drugs. And in part of this ban, they throw a bunch of opium into the sea because they confiscate it at the customs house. The king of England was like, that was my personal property. And then we have these series of wars in which European powers like the French and the British basically invade and burn China to the ground, seize their territory. This is how Hong Kong became a British colony in 1841. And it's important to remember that leading up to this period, China had been a dominant economic superpower for hundreds of years. And this is seen as humiliating for China, right? That these foreign powers basically exploited them. And they don't only blame the European powers. If you go to like the National Museum in Beijing uh, and you feel like going through three floors of national rejuvenation exhibits, you'll see that they also point to the fact that it was the Chinese who allowed this to happen. But then they also lost in another round of humiliation when the Japanese invaded them as part of World War II. And so all of these kind of add this emotional component in which they're like, we cannot regain our standing in the system until all these wrongs are righted. And Taiwan is like the central, you know, wrong that needs to be righted. In 1949, when communist forces took over the country, Chinese nationalists retreated to Taiwan where they continued to run the government of the Republic of China, vowing that one day they'd take back the mainland. Then, in the late 1970s, the U.S. normalized ties with China. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January the 1st, 1979. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China, and Taiwan is part of China. But we didn't want to turn our back on Taiwan completely, so Congress passed a law saying that it would be of, quote, grave concern if another country tried to take Taiwan by force. Enter strategic ambiguity. It's this position that the United States has not specifically said, 100% we will defend Taiwan, but we also have not said that we would not defend Taiwan. There is an understanding that there are conditions under which we would do so. And uh, for a couple of decades, this has served the United States well because it has not emboldened Taiwan to be provocative and start a war. And it has not uh, emboldened China to take moves against Taiwan, to take them by force, because both sides are somewhat uncertain about what the United States would do. Can you unpack that for me a little bit? Because it just seems like that would sow more confusion. Well, that's exactly the purpose, is so in confusion. So for all this time, Taiwan hasn't declared independence from China, partly because it's just not sure the United States would have its back. But today, Oriana says there's another side of the equation that we should be looking at, though she acknowledges that hers is a minority view. She's focused on the risk of a large-scale amphibious invasion that puts Chinese boots on Taiwan's beaches. She says China could use naval and also civilian ships to ferry troops across the narrow Taiwan Strait while airdropping others. And she says the United States would need a bit of time to amass its forces and respond, time that Chinese defense planners might see as a big enough window if they act quickly and decisively. She says, yes, it's high risk, but it's also high reward. So my argument is that for the first time, we actually have to consider that this war would happen because China starts it. And so part of it is, you know, just the capabilities issue. They could not do this before. They're confident 
right? They're stronger. They've just finished 25 years of this economic rise, political rise. And so, yeah, they think now now is the time to get what they've sort of came for this whole time. Some critics have also said that the threat is overblown because U.S. allies would isolate China economically yeah, yeah. and China wouldn't take that chance. Is that fair? Critics do say that. And I wish, like, I wish that were the case. Yeah. I don't think China thinks that's the case. And I'll tell you what, I don't either. So it's not only the economic isolation, but I'm in meetings all the time in which people are like, well, if there was a war, like, obviously the whole world would agree that the United States is right. And then everyone will side and fight with us against China. And I'm like, haven't we learned this lesson? <laughs> I don't know if that's the way it's going to go. So the first thing is our Asian allies and partners their economic relationship with China is more important than their economic relationship with the United States. And they don't want to isolate China, and they haven't. Oriana says the U.S. is also at a big geographic disadvantage. She says China has 39 air bases within about 800 kilometers of Taiwan, and the U.S. has one. How likely do you think it is in the coming years that, given China's rise, that they will make that move toward Taiwan? Oh, boy, that's the million-dollar question. You know, the only real answer is we can't be sure. What I can say is the costs of an invasion would be tremendous. That's Michael Mazar, senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. Taiwan has a significant advanced military and especially as the United States got involved, this would be a devastating cost to China. He's a little more skeptical than Oriana, partly because he says this kind of large-scale amphibious operation, it's about the hardest military operation to conduct. Taiwan isn't five miles off of China's coast, it's a hundred miles off the coast. And China only has three dozen or so major landing craft. But Mike isn't so sure the U.S. should allow itself to be drawn into a conflict over Taiwan anyway. I do think that war over Taiwan is by far the most likely source of major conflict between the United States and either Russia and China. The funny thing is, when you look at these rivalries, we don't actually have a lot of vital national interests that are irreconcilable with either of these countries. They want to change the international system. They want to get more power. They want to harass us. But it's not like we're both claiming the same piece of territory that, you know, we consider part of our nation and we're willing to go to war or whatever. Or it's not like we are necessarily seeking their destruction or they're seeking ours. And it's even different than the Cold War when the official Soviet goal was to communize the world. That is not the official Chinese goal today. In the short term, he says, we can probably breathe easy. She has the Winter Olympics coming up, which China's hosting, and the 2022 Party Congress. So to me, the best answer to the question is, they'd like to put this off as long as possible. They'd like to not have to do it. And then the question is, then in the medium term, after another 10 years, 15 years, as China gets more and more powerful and rich, do they do it? And there's so many variables attached to that question, I don't know how to answer it. Oriana thinks China is less inclined to wait. She says, if you have a chance to chase a promotion at work, but it comes a few years earlier than you expected, would you really put it off? And she says, Afghanistan doesn't really change that calculation much. So I know we like to think about these things in very straightforward, simple terms, right? There's been a lot of commentary, a lot of pundits that say, oh, the United States abandoned Afghanistan, Taiwan is next. Uh, you know, Beijing is licking their chops. I think I saw that one. Like, Beijing is licking their chops, waiting now to take Taiwan. But it's really more layered than that. Oriana says the U.S. withdrawal also introduced a whole new stack of concerns for Beijing. I think they're more worried about what it means for their neighborhood, whether they have to now put forth more resources to their border with Afghanistan to maintain stability and security. And they're worried that now the United States will actually rebalance and focus on its competition with China. So it's too simplistic to think that our decision to leave Afghanistan is sending a signal to the world that we've left the game. But it does signal that we're shifting focus. And that leaves a bigger question. How much of this game do we even want to play? We need to really be digging in and rethinking some of our old assumptions about 
the wars we're prepared to fight, how we're prepared to fight them, what our role is in places like Afghanistan, but also, you know, in Taiwan and elsewhere. It's a good thing for the United States to have a more multipolar, multilateral world system where more countries have a bigger voice. But our instincts, our habits are all take over, do it ourselves, have enough power to just crush somebody. We got to change that. This season, we've been looking at Biden's plans to reimagine foreign policy in ways that bolster the middle class right here at home. Political scientist Mike Mazar has a few suggestions. But first, he says we have to think differently about what a safer world would actually look like. What I think would be really neat is if there's a clear concept with a theory of success for this is how American power creates a safer and better world for the American people and also for others in a way that is different than it has. Mike says that right now, our defense is kind of on autopilot. So let's reassess. What's the biggest threat we face? Is it large-scale foreign war? Is it stuff like cyber attacks, climate change, future pandemics? Probably not the large-scale war, right? I'm not saying we should abolish our military. My argument is that we have this overhang of thinking that we are the dominant and superior power in the world that we are gonna seek superiority and overmatch in all of our military relationships. And particularly with regard to China and especially with regard to contingencies like Taiwan, I think that trying to uphold that is becoming unsustainable. Right now, Mike says, we look around the world and say, what wars do we wanna be able to fight? And what do we need to win? And then we add that all up. You know, the ticker just keeps going up and up and up. And the standard of we need to win that decisively, and if that takes 3,000 F-35s, that's what we need to buy. I just don't think we can do that anymore. The alternative, he says, is to decide on a reasonable amount we're willing to spend. Probably a little less than we're spending now to allow for some shifting priorities. And then we create a budget. It's just this different approach of saying we're going to live within our means, build the very best military we can. As opposed to saying, I insist on maintaining a certain very rigorous standard of absolute success in a lot of these extremely distant and challenging wars. So focus more on the non-war threats to American people. And then within the focus on wars, change how we think about it. Would you tie this thinking in with the Biden administration's movement toward a foreign policy for the middle class and what you think they're trying to achieve? I think a foreign policy for the middle class is a perfectly effective political slogan. In practical foreign policy terms, I don't think it means anything at all. I mean nothing. Because if we fought a war over Taiwan, it would be the worst thing for the American middle class since 1945 and maybe ever in the modern history of the United States. Mike's referring there to the Second World War, a war that ended after the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And to be clear, Biden hasn't said that he would fight a war over Taiwan, or that he wouldn't. Strategic ambiguity strikes again. Mike says, Taiwan is a fellow democracy and an ally. And of course, we want to do everything we can to support that. It's also the world's major supplier of semiconductors. But that doesn't mean we should necessarily plan to go to war. There are, of course, a thousand ways to help promote democracy around the world short of the use of military force. And I think the use of large-scale military force, especially in ways that threatens escalation that could risk a nuclear war, is the most profound act that should be reserved for only the most vital national interests. And if we're going to uphold that and say we shouldn't go to war to protect dictators or to impose our imperial rule or whatever, we also have to uphold that rule to say just because a country is a democracy does not automatically mean the United States should plan on going to war in the event they're threatened. We admire Taiwan's democracy. We want to do everything possible to help them defend themselves within the constraints we've established in these various policies. We want to make clear to China that they would suffer severely if they use military force. We want to rally the world to convey that message. We want to do all that in service of our democratic values. Going to war is a separate question, I think. I mean, the bottom line is that wars are very easy to avoid. 
You just give the other side everything they want. That's Oriana Schuyler Mastro again. So we just kind of have to decide as a country, what is the degree to which we want to stop Chinese expansionism? So where do we want to draw the line? And then, you know, militarily, I'll just tell you, it's a lot harder to fight China once they have Taiwan. Now, if they have Taiwan, one, they basically absorb all of Taiwan's military assets. So all of our packages to Taiwan, a lot of them have been aircraft. This is the number one weakness of the Chinese military is their ability to develop aircraft. Now, all of a sudden, they will be flying U.S. aircraft. Not great. And then now they have from Taiwan, from that platform, they can project power farther out. I put a similar question to Oriana about how Biden's foreign policy for the middle class fits into her calculations on Taiwan, especially if it means limiting military resources to invest more at home. And it might be worth mentioning here that we talked to Oriana from her home in Australia, where she spent the last year in part to protect her toddler, who has respiratory issues, from COVID surges in the U.S. Australia seemed safer. The number one thing we can do in competing with China is focusing on building our own resiliency, our own strengths at home. And while we're doing that at home, we still have to make sure that China's not making moves in Asia. And I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we can do both at the same time. And this goes right to the heart of what we've been trying to understand this season. What does it really mean to shift our priorities as radically as the slogan foreign policy for the middle class, if it's anything more than a slogan, might suggest. What does it mean to change the way that we've done things for the past 20 or 30 years? Because after 18 months of pandemic stress, an insurrection at the Capitol, protests in the streets, a lost war, it's worth admitting, maybe we can do better. I will just say one thing, it's just completely outside of my area of expertise, but I found it very amusing. Foreign Affairs had an article recently about mothers in China. And the whole article went through just how horrible it is to live in this communist regime as a mother. Because women are pregnant and they're still having to work. And women are getting paid less after they have kids. (laughs) And it seems like this communist party has no appreciation for all the benefits that mothers bring to society. And I read this whole thing and I just kept on thinking like, is no one's seen the irony of this, right? Anyone in America who has children. <laughs> I'm like, somebody letting me not work here in America? <laughs> right, exactly. You're like, oh, you get a day off? Like, yeah, I was nursing my kids while I was testifying on the Hill. Like, you know, as a woman in defense with two very small kids, I was just kind of like, really, guys? Like, the horrible communist regime is doing this to their women? So, you know, I can't tell you on the foreign policy side, but every time we get a new administration, I'm just like, can somebody just help us? You know, like, can we just have, like, daycare, like, actual quality child care in our country? And can it be tax deductible? (laughs) I'm all supportive of the Biden administration trying to think of of ways to, you know, improve this American experiment. And, And I have some suggestions if anyone wants to hear them. But I don't think it needs to detract from the competition with China. If there's one thing we've learned this season, or this year, or these past two years, is that the U.S. doesn't have it all figured out. But changing the way we do things, say, shifting away from a decades-long focus on weapons and wars, it doesn't have to mean opening ourselves up to attack. In fact, getting our budget under control and shifting some spending toward addressing things like climate change and future pandemics might make us safer in the end. I just sent my kid to kindergarten for the first time, and there's already a COVID outbreak at his school. And we're about to welcome an infant into the house any day. So I don't know about you, but my family feels this particular threat more deeply than probably any in our lives. We'd like to believe that the point of this American experiment is to make life better for the millions of people like us and not like us who need the system to work better for them. And maybe a foreign policy for the middle class, if we did it right, could do that. If you agree or if you don't and you have an experience you'd like to share, we'd really love to hear from you. 
Record a voicemail and send it to boom at inkstickmedia.com. If we get enough responses, we'll share them on a bonus episode later this year. Which brings us to our final point, which is that this is the last official episode of our season. We'll be back with a brand new season in the new year, but don't go anywhere. Because we have some really cool bonus content lined up for you guys in the meantime. And, of course, we'll be back to check on this whole idea of a foreign policy for the middle class as it evolves. Things That Go Boom is produced by Inkstick Media and distributed by PRX. This episode was produced by Ruth Morris and me and edited by Layla Ujali. Darian Shulman writes the music for our show. And Robin Wise makes everything sound shiny and new. You can follow us over at Inkstick Media or me at Just Lacey. And remember, we always love it if you leave us a review. Or you can shoot us an email at boom at inkstickmedia.com. We'd love to hear what you'd like us to cover next. Thank you, as always, to the foundations that make our work possible. The Carnegie Corporation of New York and Plowshares Fund, as well as Inkstick supporters, including the Cologne Foundation, Craig Newmark Foundation, Prospect Hill Foundation, and the Jubitz Family Foundation. And thank you to all of you for supporting our show. We'll see you soon. You know, yeah, and I guess no. I guess we're advanced because a lot of my jobs, they were like, oh, don't worry. If you want to take time, we'll just delay your promotions by years. And you're like, oh, thanks, you know. I worked so hard just to get yes. promoted like years later than my colleagues. Right.